So hello, my name is Ruth Ting and I'm a palliative care consultant in a large teaching hospital here in London, um, which started taking COVID patients right at the beginning of the outbreak in London. And what we found was that many doctors and nurses and other clinical staff, they wanted to know more about the palliative care approach for, for looking after patients, especially for those who are um, having severe COVID disease. So the palliative care team here has always been part of the COVID response. And what I will cover today are the main palliative care issues that non-palliative care staff have found helpful to learn when they are uh, looking after severe COVID patients. So there are three main learning objectives today. Firstly, how to manage breathlessness and anxiety in severe COVID-19. How to make a parallel plan for patients who are ill enough that they might die. And thirdly, just um, a few words on how we can communicate better with patients and families at this time. So let's begin. I think the first thing to notice about COVID-19 is that many people have very mild disease. And um, for some, it is um, easier to predict that they will get severe disease, but we don't know. We don't know um, when someone is going to get severe disease. And people with severe disease um, have a very uncertain outcome. Rapid deterioration is often a feature in severe COVID disease. So in a matter of a day or several hours, the patient is a lot worse, feeling a lot worse and needing a lot more oxygen and treatment. So things can progress very quickly in severe COVID disease. And it's hard to predict the outcome. Some people um, develop severe symptoms and then they go on to get better, but some people go on to deteriorate and die. So it's about starting good holistic care early, regardless of the prognosis of the patient. It is important to pay attention not just to patients that you are um, suspicious that they might die, but to pay attention to all your patients, um, even if they are going to get better, because good symptom management, good holistic care is part of good medical care. So many clinicians, you can regret sometimes um, if patients deteriorate so rapidly, you didn't have time to offer um, a peaceful and uh, a good death. So therefore, it's good to um, start thinking about holistic care early, regardless of what you think the prognosis is for this patient with severe COVID disease. So let's do the first point breathlessness and agitation in severe COVID-19. The main thing that we notice uh, for patients who are deteriorating with severe disease is that they become really symptomatic quickly. And what we found really helpful is using continuous infusions of a couple of medications to relieve their symptoms, starting at about the same time as starting all the medical treatments and continuing their medical treatments. So patients with severe disease, we find that they are usually too unwell to swallow. Um, and we find that giving them an infusion early helps bring their symptoms under control early so that we are not um, chasing our tail um, and one step behind getting control of their symptoms. So continuous infusions here um, in London, we tend to use subcutaneously, but some places will be using IV infusions as well. So the two main medications that we use for controlling breathlessness um, and agitation are morphine and midazolam. And these are um, very small doses, morphine 10 milligrams, midazolam 10 milligrams, and they are sort of over 24 hours and therefore less than uh, half a milligram per hour. And morphine has been shown to be effective for the sensation of breathlessness. It doesn't um, improve your saturations, your oxygen saturations. It might not even improve your respiratory rate, but what it does 
is it gives you the sen um, relief from that um, sensation of breathlessness. So they feel more comfortable um, from a breathing point of view. And when someone feels more comfortable, they are easier to reassure. So they are able to listen to your words and able to respond to your words. They are able to calm down and maybe express what they are thinking and feeling to you. They are maybe even able to talk to their family over the phone um, in a more comfortable way. So there are many advantages of controlling symptoms for a patient, regardless of whether they are going to get better or whether they are going to get worse. The midazolam is there to also help patients who are feeling extremely anxious and panicky about their breathlessness. And it just takes the edge off that combination of breathlessness and agitation. Um, here in this hospital in London, we have done a case series of 101 patients um, that were referred to palliative care. And 58 of these patients with severe disease needed um, an infusion of morphine and midazolam. And out of these 58, 40 patients found that they benefited from this combination um, and their symptoms felt more tolerable. So it's important to think about continuous infusions early. The other important thing about um, anticipation of symptoms. So when someone is deteriorating and you fear that they might die, there are some symptoms that might happen as uh, things progress. So some patients who are in the last hours or days of life, they also experience fever, cough, nausea and vomiting, maybe some respiratory secretions and delirium. So what we're recommending is prescribing as required medications, usually by a subcut route, subcutaneous route, um, to anticipate for the symptoms. And the idea is to leave as little gap between the onset of symptoms and the um, treatment of those symptoms. So if it's already prescribed, then a nurse is able to um, administer this to the patient without having to uh, find someone to prescribe, assess and prescribe for them. So we would really encourage people to start thinking about as required medications in anticipation of deterioration. So moving on to the second learning point, which is about parallel planning. And the question here is, what other things need to be in place already in case of rapid deterioration? So there will be a medical plan in place. Medically, you know that you might have to increase oxygen, you know that you might have to escalate to intensive care. So these are medical plans that you need to have in place. But when we think about holistic care, there are other aspects. So what is it that we need to have in place to ensure that the patient's autonomy and wishes um, continue to be respected? Uh, what about their um, dignity? and the care for their family. So these things need to be answered um, in order to provide holistic care um, and humane care um, if a patient should deteriorate so much that they might die. So parallel planning requires you to use good communication skills. So remember to give lots of um, pauses, use words that are at the patient's level, don't use jargon, have a lot of um, opportunities for them to ask questions um, and listen to them and give them an opportunity to stop the conversation or pause the conversation. But the main three things that I want to talk about when you're talking about holistic care and planning in parallel is these three things. Firstly, Clarify a person's preferences for decision-making. Have they ever expressed or written down 
their preferences if they have a life-threatening condition. For example, did they say anything to friends and family or their doctors about um, CPR, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or intensive care intubation and ventilation? Do find out whether they've previously legally appointed someone to make decisions for them, because we really want to make sure that whatever care we provide is in line with what the patient would have wanted. Secondly, I think it's very important to ask them, who are the important people in your life? Who are the people that we could communicate with when you are unwell and you are unable to speak? And the thing, the practical thing about this is once you find that out, to write their names and contact details down as accurately as possible because um, if deterioration happens quickly, then you want to be able to find a phone number to ring immediately. And thirdly, um, having spoken to the patient about their condition, uh, perhaps it's important to give them the opportunity to clarify, to tell you their life priorities. So I would normally ask a question like, Knowing what we've discussed, what you know now, is there anything else that would be important to you at this time? And are there any spiritual needs that we can help you with at this time? So all of that is important for parallel planning and the words that we use are really important. Um, communication in COVID, severe COVID disease is particularly challenging because we are going to be talking to patients um, under a layer of uh, personal protective equipment, under a layer of uh, PPE with a mask and a gown. And this makes it very difficult, especially for patients who can't hear very well or who can't see very well, or maybe patients who have some memory problems. So it's especially difficult for us because we don't we are unable to use our non-verbal ways of providing reassurance and conveying our um, compassion, kindness to people. So we are relying a lot on words. And even when we speak to families, it is over the phone. And we are relying again on words rather than non-verbal communication um, to convey our concerns and our care. So here are some phrases that I have found useful, that our team has found useful when talking to patients and their families. So I always like to use the word hope because I think families and patients want to be hopeful. But also as a, as a healthcare professional, it is my duty to also share some worries to express that I am worried that they will continue to deteriorate. Um, so I'll say something like, I hope you start to respond to everything that we're doing right now, but I am quite worried that you will continue to deteriorate in spite of our best treatments. And then if I think that someone is ill enough that they may die, I do try to use the word die as well, because what I found is that people who hear the word seriously ill, very, very unwell, they still don't um, allow themselves to think that they are dying. And so I want to convey that this is a possibility, that dying is a possibility. And the reason why I want to do this is so that someone can use that information so a patient or their family can use that information to, to say the things they really need to say, to make the arrangements they want to arrange, and to make their peace, really. Um, and that's their opportunity to do so. I find that if we don't use the word die, then we rob people of this opportunity to use that information. So again, it's about being really gentle and really kind, but imparting the truth because you know that they might be able to use that information. So I'll say something like, I'm really afraid that there has been a further deterioration and I'm afraid your relative is so seriously ill now that he may die. And then I go on to talk about parallel planning. We are really hoping for the best. He's on maximum treatment. 
but I do think it might be wise for you and your family to start planning for the worse and give them time to think about that, to react, and then ask, knowing the full picture now, what would be important to you and your loved one at this time? And here's your opportunity to um, be creative about what they say. Here we have some iPads and iPhones. If they say, I just need to see them one last time, then you are able to use those technologies to help you. So. Um, it's important to ask this question, what is important to you now that you know this information? And always give plenty of comfort and reassurance. And I tend to use the words, we are doing all that we can. And whichever path this takes, we will do our best to make sure that he or she remains very comfortable. So these are not easy conversations to have. They are even less easy because of PPE and less easy because of um, the barriers of using a phone. But they are so important still and people will appreciate your kindness. So we've covered the three learning points. Firstly, managing breathlessness and agitation and the use of subcutaneous or intravenous infusions. Secondly, parallel planning and other things that ensure a person um, is able to die um, in peace and with dignity. And thirdly, we've looked at some words that might be helpful um, when you're communicating. But I want to just end by saying that looking after COVID patients is not easy. It is sometimes extremely tragic. And so it is very important for you to look after yourself and for you to look after your team as well. And it's okay not to feel okay about this. Um, it is very tragic times for us. It's okay to talk to each other about it because I guarantee you that um, when you talk about it, you will find a few people who feel exactly the same way as you. And think about what strategies have worked for you in the past when you personally faced a challenging time. Perhaps it's time that you try these strategies to help you get through this time. So I have listed some additional learning resources here um, and some references for you to read if you want to learn more about palliative care and holistic care for patients who have severe COVID disease. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them if you will email me. Thank you.